Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, all right, we're going to get into it. So, hey, guys, if you don't know me, uh, I'm Kim Lane. I'm the online master coach from Clean Health Fitness Institute, and we're partnered with Sebastian Oreb to bring you Strength Systems International Certification Level 1, which is live and on the website, and then Level 2, which is soon to be launched. Um, we're going to get stuck into today's question, which is actually very personal and lighthearted because it is on the topic of getting to know Sebastian Oreb. Um, so if you have any more questions that we haven't, uh, we won't go through because they did come through this morning and you are dying to know when we are watching live, um, just pop them in the comments and we'll try to get through as many as we can. So we'll get straight into it. Uh, Bass, when was your first ever powerlifting competition? Um, so I've got a 10 year old daughter and I remember that it was in the first year of her being alive. So that was 10 years ago. So that was 20, uh, 2010. And um, I don't know exactly when that was, uh, like what month in 2010 it was, but I just remember her in the background in her nappies with, uh, with my wife holding her. And uh, I'll tell you the numbers that I got as well. I was in the 93 kilogram class. I squatted 230 kilograms. Mm -hmm. I benched 150 kilograms and I deadlifted 250 kilograms for a 630 kilogram total, um, which I was incredibly happy with at the time. Um, of course, I've evolved a lot since then, but um, yeah, that, that's what it was. Well, what are your numbers now, just as a comparison of time? So, that was a 6.30 total. My most recent competition was um, 310 kilograms more than that, so that was a 940 kilogram total. So, I went from a 2.30 squat to a 375. I went from a 150 bench to a 240 bench. Mm -hmm. And I went from a three, sorry, a two fifty deadlift to a three thirty deadlift. So um, significant improvements across the board. And that's actually just my last competition. If you've been following my training, my goal is to, of course, beat all of that. Um, the goal is to get a thousand kilogram total, um, which I, I'm on track for. Yeah, definitely. Especially from all your training that I've seen, like, I think you're definitely on course for that. Yeah, but I mean, anything can happen on the day. So I see a lot of amazing athletes that perform really well on comp day, and sometimes it just doesn't come together. So we'll True. see. We'll see. All right, I'm going to go to the, one of the other questions, which is, can you explain how you trained half For example, what type of program technique did you use? For, for whom? For Hathor. Uh, for Hathor Bjornsson. So this is an interesting one. So... Um, you know, obviously my specialty is in, in strength and, and more specifically with powerlifting because that's what I do. Uh, but that didn't come from being a powerlifter initially. That came from developing strength to be a martial artist, which I was a poor martial artist, but I was into it anyway. And I created a, a method where we used very much based around a four-day-a-week program where we had two upper body push-pull days, one squat-focused day, and one deadlift-focused day. Now, when Hathor approached me um, for programming and for coaching, I obviously was very nervous because he's the pinnacle of strength. He's, uh, he wasn't at the time, but he was uh, second best in the world at the time. So, obviously, I was very intimidated by that. Um, it, was, it was a very big task, but I knew I had what it took because I have a lot of confidence with the splits that I use. So, basically, I... I figured out the events that we were working towards. So in Strongman, which is what Hathor Bjornsson competes in, um, you don't get a, a pre-set competition where all of the events are the same. So uh, every competition, so World Strongest Man especially, they only um, find out about what events are going to be in competition about a month before the event. So, so a lot of the events are kind of, they, they come as a surprise. So we still know that roughly there's going to be some type of overhead pressing component. There's going to be some type of deadlifting component. There's going to be some type of medley. Um, so like a, a you know sandbag carrying events type of thing. Um, you know, and there's a list of different exercises that I categorize within the upper body push-pull days. So such as any of the log press or any of the pressing movements, they go in the upper body days. Um, the, the deadlift day, there's a, like every strongman competition, they might have an axle deadlift, they might have a one rep max deadlift, they might have a deadlift for reps. 
But either way, I know that the program needs to fall within the deadlift day. And there's other exercises that load the same structures as deadlift, such as, um, such as atlas stones. I'll structure that in on the same day as the deadlift. Um, things like yoke. Uh, for those who don't know what a yoke is, imagine a giant squat rack where you have to pick up the whole squat rack and run with it. So I kind of um, consider that a lower body loading exercise and I have programmed that in on the same day as my squat day. So I, I kind of figure out the events based on those four days, those three patterns. So, so push pattern, squat pattern, and deadlift pattern. And um, it, it proved to be successful with Hathor. And obviously, I've been working with him since 2016. So we have definitely made mistakes, but at the same time, he's a highly experienced athlete. And, you know, I didn't just write a program and he said, yes, sir, that's what I'm doing. You know, he was able to give me feedback along the way. And we were able to uh, create the programs working together. Um, and it ended up being a winning formula because uh, in 2018, he became the world's strongest man. So it worked. Yeah, I actually think that's interesting how you don't know what um, will be integrated in this, the competition itself and you just walk around the movement patterns. I actually think that's a really small way to do it. Yeah, it's the only thing that we can do is consider the movement patterns because it's like, unfortunately, for world's strongest man, they just don't know the events, which in powerlifting, not only do we know the events, I also can tell you what barbell we're going to use um, for each of the individual events. It's a different barbell for the squat, the bench press, the deadlift, and I own each and every one of those in the gym so that I can train as specifically for these events as possible, which is why actually the world records for most powerlifting competitions are closer to the potential, um, to human potential, whereas in strongman, like I said, they only know the event four weeks out. So if they set a world record on a certain piece of equipment, you know, these guys haven't even trained that well for it. So yeah. it's, it's testament to how strong the world's strongest men actually are. Yeah, for sure. All right, we're going to segue back to you now. Um, yeah. What is your favorite part about being a coach? Look, I love helping people. You know, for me... Um, you know, and the style of help that I love to give isn't like um, aesthetic based. I'm not going to say that aesthetic uh, isn't my specialty. Like I do know how to get people looking good, but I'm more about health. I'm more about function. I'm more about strength. I'm more about movement. When I see my athletes or my members of my, my coaching um, progressing with movement or being able to move pain free, it's incredibly rewarding for me. Um, you know, I started off my first bits of uh, investment in my education was on rehabilitation. So I'd have to say the most rewarding part of my job is, is definitely having people move without pain when they previously couldn't. Yeah, that's a, I like that too. That's great. Um, when did you start at Base Gym? So Base Gym, uh, where, we're, where we're at now, this is Base Gym. Uh, we're in Marrickville. Uh, sunny over there lifting, but this is, uh, we've been here for about a year to two years. It's hard to keep track of time since this COVID situation. Uh, 2020 yeah. been a little bit of a blur, but um, we had base gym in North Sydney five years before that. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that was probably about 2014. We started yeah. base gym. So that was myself, my wife and her sister. Um, they're also known as the Base Body Babes. We collaborated to create our own space, which has been such an incredible journey. It's been a, a very um, energy-consuming journey as well. There's been plenty of downs, but uh, at the end of it, I'm really happy with what we have. Now, before this, I was working uh, for Fitness First for 10 years, so this, uh, a regular commercial space. Um, so a lot of people, they ask me for my advice on where's a great place to start. And I always advise big commercial gyms like that because that gives you access to a million dollars worth of equipment as well as thousands of members. So I, I think that um, I'm very fortunate that I started in the right place. Yeah, I agree with that. I think for anyone starting out, it's always good to be immersed in an environment where there's a lot of people coming at you, whether it's clients or other PTs, and you can just learn and absorb. And it's, it's so valuable. I agree. Um, when did you start working with Clean Health? Interestingly, I met uh, so the, the founder of Clean Health, which is Dane McDonald. We both worked together at Fitness First in North Sydney, um, you know, around 2000 and, uh, 
when, when did I meet him? It would have been about 2006, 2007. Um, so we've been working together. We've been great friends uh, since we were colleagues at Fitness First. Um, but then Dane branched out uh, to open his own gym, which was Clean Health. And I reached out to Dane to start doing some of my powerlifting education at his facility, which uh, that probably happened, I'd say about 2010, around then. So, so probably about 10 years ago, I was doing seminars with Dane um, out of his facility. So we, we've got a long history of working together. Yeah, and look, 10 years on, you're still working together. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's, it's, it's quite unique to have relationships, especially working relationships that last that long. Um, but Dane and I both have um, very similar ideas with a lot of things, and it just works. So we're very fortunate to have that. Yeah, that's really good. All right, next question is, what is your favorite meal? I'd have to say... Um, a veal schnitzel <laughs> so oh, it's really? probably yeah I, I love it it's fried it's a little bit dirty as in uh, it's one of those things that i shouldn't be eating daily and i don't eat it daily uh, but that's probably why i like it most of the meals that i uh the staple of my nutrition is is uh, revolves around beef and rice mm. and i although i love that food when you eat it multiple times per day every day you get a little bit bored of it so the stuff that I don't eat, eat as frequently is probably my favorite uh, from a taste perspective. I've got to give a shout out right here. I've got uh, Ron Kingy over there waving hello. He's a 265-kilogram bench presser, and this is many years ago that he was working when we opened Base Gym. And uh, I'm very happy to say he's back on the team. So he stopped lifting um, competitively for many years, and as of this week, he's back. So... Be prepared oh, to check out Ron Kingy with some big bench press goals. Um, spoiler alert, he's going for 300 kilograms sometime soon. So that's coming up. Watch this space. <laughs> Watch this space. All right, cool. Next question is, um, do you keep, take pre-workout? Yes, I do. Um, usually it's just caffeine. And I'll only do that on my kind of heavy day. So currently with my program, for those who've been following, I only do, I, I train four days a week. And of those four days, one day is heavy bench press, one day is heavy squat or deadlift. And those are the only days that I will take caffeine supplementation. Um, it's quite mild. I think it's about 250 milligrams of caffeine. Um, but it's probably not as beneficial as coming into my session with um, adequate food. So I'll, I would have had before each of my sessions, um, sorry, food and hydration, I would have had you know, a serving of oatmeal with protein powder and between four to six eggs before mm. I come into my session, as well as about um, half a litre to one litre of water. Um, yeah. That's probably the most beneficial form of, of pre-workout that I can tell you that I do have, but I know what the question was, and it was more geared towards the supplement of pre-workout. Yeah. My answer is, yeah, 250 milligrams of caffeine only okay. for my heavy days. All right, cool. Um, next question is, what keeps you motivated to train? I'm really competitive, and this is going to be an interesting one. Um, I'm 38 years old, and I'm kind of flirting with the idea of this being my last powerlifting competition. Uh, but like I said, you know, that's what gives me motivation to train. I'm competitive. The numbers that I'm going for will, will make me number one in Australia in my weight category. Um, and I know that every record that I've made before has been beaten and that's what motivates me to keep coming back so as i said i'm flirting with the idea of making this my last competition but who knows what happens when my record gets beaten um maybe that will give me the itch to come back again yeah for sure i mean you can only better yourself right if you do each exactly time. and i mean i don't plan on stopping training just because i stopped competing uh and for me like i, I like to work towards something instead of just training aimlessly I, I love the idea of having a competition to train for. So who knows what the future holds, but, but yeah, my competitiveness is what, what motivates me to train. Yeah, I love that. All right, next question is, in your opinion, what are your top three reasons why someone might plateau? Number one technique. So the first thing that people, when they come to me, um, you know, with that, the reason why they may have plateaued is because they're not lifting correctly. 
So that's the first place that I look is lifting technique. Um, once they've reached the, te- the, the lifting technique and they are doing that correctly, and some instances people do come to me with excellent lifting technique, but they still plateau. This is when it comes down to programming structure. Now, programming structure, the number one place that I look at is if it is a well-balanced or a structurally balanced uh, approach to training. Um, a very uh, simplistic uh, formula that I have for upper bodies to utilize a push-pull ratio of one-to-one. It does go in a lot more depth uh, with that. And uh, those of you who have done my strength system education will know exactly how deep it gets into um, the degree of structural balance that I expect. Um, but if there is no structural balance factored into the programming, it's a very easy way to reach the lifting plateau. Um, and number three is nutrition. If you're not fueling yourself for performance, um, you know, nutrition will come in the same category as recovery. So, um, you know, eating the right amount of good nutritious food as well as uh, quality sleep and uh, hydration. So that's, that's all in the one category of recovery. Um, those are the three main reasons you will plateau. Now, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this. So my apologies for making this long-winded. I'm only 38 years old, but I've never plateaued. Um, well, sorry, I have plateaued, uh, but currently I'm not plateauing. I'm still moving forward once I realized what I was doing wrong. So I kind of always wanted to give the answer that you should always be able to move forward. But I didn't think that I qualified to answer that question adequately because I'm only 38 years old. I don't know what's going to happen as I get older. Mm. Uh, but something, something interesting about that is I did a seminar with uh, the great Ed Cohen, who is known as the greatest powerlifter of all time. And someone asked him the, um, or a similar question, at what age would you plateau? And his answer was that he never plateaued. Now, this is a man who stood the test of time, and the only reason that he stopped is because he had rheumatoid arthritis in his hip. But apart from that, um, he had a high focus on correct programming as well as lifting technique, and he was testament to uh, the answer that you shouldn't ever plateau if you know how to do it right. Mm, that's, that's really interesting. I like that. Um, now, the questions kind of steer more back to strength and training. Um, so we're going to go into the question, which is, what are the best exercises to strengthen the hamstrings? I would have to say my favorite exercise, so there's two ways of loading the hamstring. Two of the major functions of the hamstring is hip joint extension. So that's your exercises like uh, Romanian deadlifts and good mornings. And I'd say they're my two favorite uh, hip extensor exercises to load the hamstring. Um, and then we've got knee flexion is the secondary function. Uh, so simplistic exercises like a hamstring curl, um, we can set that up a little bit by doing bodyweight hamstring curls such as a glute ham raise or a Nordic drop. Um, but that's something that I factor in with all of my trainings to ensure that we're doing some type of hip extension to load the hamstrings as well as some type of knee flexion exercise uh, to load the hamstrings on the other angle. So number one and two, I have to say, Number one is the Romanian deadlift, which is hip extension. Number two is the hamstring curl, which is knee flexion. Awesome. Uh, next question up is um, recommendations for grip width. Um, for, for bench press? Uh, it doesn't specify, but I think so. Yeah, for grip width, people are normally talking about with pressing. Now, in a powerlifting competition, I'm going to take you over to my powerlifting barbell. Um, the rule is that you are only allowed to go as wide as index finger on the outer ring of the powerlifting bar so that's as wide so that's on both sides obviously so yeah index finger or nose picking finger on the outer ring of the powerlifting bar now this can be an advantage with range of motion because the wider you hold that barbell the shorter the range of motion of the lift and this can be beneficial however if you don't have the strength and the structure supporting the shoulders with that width you can injure yourself so my recommendation is to make sure that you've developed the foundation to be able to uh, load from that, that grip width, which I have. That's the grip width that I use, but a lot of uh, lifters that don't have the same amount of years of experience, or they don't have you know, beginner lifters, for example, I, I never really recommend that they start with the grip width that wide. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I will never let anyone go wider than that, even if they're not competitive powerlifters. And the reason why I don't let people go wider is because the way that 100% of the bench press racks are created in this world, if you go wider than that, you're going to jam your fingers in the rack. Mm-hmm. So, so that's as wide as I, I ever teach it, whether you're a powerlifter or not. 
And if you don't have uh, uh, the muscle mass supporting the shoulders of that width, I'll always recommend slightly narrower, but I yeah. never recommend narrower than shoulder width. Yeah, that's fair. Now we've got two more uh, grip related questions. The next one is what is the best way to strengthen grip? So grip is specific to the task at hand. Okay. For example, I train with a lot of incredibly strong people, um, but when it comes to the deadlift, I can hold a heavier weight than these strong people. And when I say strong people, people that have stronger grip than me. So people that can hold on to um, thick grip implements for a longer period of time than me. But then when it comes to the deadlift, um, that's a grip strength exercise that I have uh, you know, specific experience in. And I can hold on to heavier weights than these people that I'm, I'm telling you have stronger grip than me. Um, so it depends on what you want to have strong grip for. If you want a strong grip for deadlifts, I recommend doing deadlifts um, without straps or without any type of support. Yeah. Um, but um, apart from that, if you just want kind of like general real world functional kind of grip strength, like whether it's for for combat sports like martial arts to hold on to somebody. Um, you know, my recommendation is thick grip implements. Mm. Okay, so um, some dumbbell companies, like the dumbbells, uh, the company that I use, sell thick grip dumbbell handles. Um, now, here's another one of my favorites. Um, a lot of people that come to me that want to have a strong grip are jiu-jitsu fighters and wrestlers. So for these guys, one of my favorite exercises is a chin up holding a towel or mm. even more specific holding on to a gi or the kimono which is what they use uh, to wrestle with so it's going to be very specific to the grip requirement of their sport yeah i think that's very similar to like for example certain companies make the dog bone attachments for cable rolls and things like that where it's testing the grip yes so I think I've, got a lot of, really I've got a lot of those attachments and I do a lot of my rows and pull-ups and pull-downs with those attachments and they are excellent. But like I said, I've got people that are very good with those exercises, but then when they come to the deadlift, they might lose grip with the deadlift, which is strange, but it just goes to show that it's very specific to the task at hand. Yeah, for sure. Another um, grip-related question is when it comes to the conventional deadlift, Grip-wise, doing a mixed grip, should you rotate your hands each set? Specificity is huge with me. So in competition, I use my right hand is my pronated grip and my left hand is my supinated grip. And whenever mm. I use a mixed grip, that's the only grip that I use. And the reason for this, here's a little experiment for those at home. Um, do this. Okay, so this feels normal for lo most people. Now, if you change it, do exactly the same thing but swap your fingers it feels horrible it just feels wrong right yeah. so there's one way this is a motor engram it feels right on one grip and it just feels wrong with with the other so it's the same with um you know going from a mixed grip with this grip to here so whenever i do this i can't hold on to as much with my deadlift it's a really dumb thing but that's why my recommendation for mixed grip deadlifting is to be performing reps of five and less with your competition grip. And whenever you're doing more than five reps, use a double pronated grip with straps. Um, okay. Now I'll elaborate on that. I've never seen anyone. So the question usually related to that one is, will that create imbalances? Yeah. And my answer to that question is I've never seen anyone uh, have an imbalance that's been caused from mixed grip deadlifting that has negatively affected any part of their life. Mm, that's fair. Um, all right. So now off topic of grip, we're going to go to foam rolling before, after training or not at all. Uh, okay. I, in my opinion, if you enjoy it and it feels good for you, um, and it creates some type of placebo effect, like foam rolling to massage the muscles. Um, it actually, there's no evidence to support that it has anything beneficial. However, there are ways of using the foam roller to mobilize your joints and that, um, you know, that there is a lot of evidence to support that that is beneficial. So 
It's like, you know, having a massage, which is essentially what a lot of people do with a foam roller, having yeah. a massage can, can turn off the muscles or make them sleepy. You know, it'll inhibit the muscles. So we don't want that. We want them to be alive and awake and contracting forcefully. So, mm. so technically, using a foam roller to massage your muscles before lifting can actually be a negative. Well, that's, I did not know that. I think because you see yeah, well, people that are doing, doing that. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of people train because they see other people, you know, train specific ways because they see other people doing it. It uh, doesn't mean it's the right thing. Um, so, so technically, as I said, I'm not saying there's no benefits to using a foam roller. Um, I use a foam roller to mobilize my thoracic spine um, to, to help myself get into the extended position required of a bench press, which is very beneficial. Um, but that's mobilizing joints rather than massaging muscles yeah okay um next question is do you cue uh, anything differently when squatting in rats versus sleeves yes but the, the correct answer to that is it depends at what at what stage of the lifter's lifting career so when yeah. a lifter if it was you for example kimmy and you came to me and you said i want to try these wraps for the first time i yeah. would wrap your knees very gently so it doesn't hurt you and I would tell you to do the exact same thing as your normal squat, to not change anything, to squat how you would normally squat. But then, uh, um, as you got more experience with the knee wraps, I would be wrapping them with more tension. I'd be going tighter and tighter, and you'd be able to tolerate that pain because the skin on your knees would be conditioned at that point. And at yeah. the point where we're able to go tighter, yes, I do slightly cue it differently, and the cues are to think about pushing your knees uh, more forward and stop thinking about the cue. A lot of people think of a cue push your butt back when you squat, uh, and that's yeah. great to use your hips. But when you push your butt back and you're using knee wraps, you're not getting the most out of the knee wraps. Now, right. I can get 50 kilograms of, of extra weight when I use knee wraps. The way that I do that is I force my torso to be as upright as possible, and I push my knees forward into the knee wraps so that I get the maximum rebound out of the rebound, out of the, out of the knee wraps. Right, okay, wow. Um, okay, this is one more um, related to bench press. For higher rep ranges, should we hold the breath for the full set? Well, I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. So, um, my last time I did a high rep range set was a 20 rep set, and I held my breath for the entire set. Um, the reason why I like to hold my breath is because I believe that once you exhale, you lose position very slightly, position that you won't be able to regain again. Mm. So when people exhale during a bench press at any point, I call that the breath of death. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, now, usually when people are performing really high rep sets like that, it doesn't matter as much. Um, yeah. But it depends on how much the set means to you. So for me, I don't really do much high rep sets, so it doesn't matter that much. But if yeah. I was doing reps of five and less, my recommendation is absolutely to hold the breath throughout the entire set. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that we had from this morning. Uh, I'm just going to jump to the comments now. This is a question about your opinion on CrossFit as a way to keep fit. Thoughts? I, I think CrossFit is excellent, you know. In this day and age, especially in the fitness industry, it seems like it's a bit of a bandwagon or a, a cool thing to, you know, if you're not a, a, if you're a powerlifter, you're going to say negative stuff about CrossFitters. And if you're a bodybuilder, you know, you've got to speak negatively about the sport that you don't play. Well, I'm not for that. I think that people should train the way that makes them happy. Same with things like jogging. I don't like jogging, but I don't think you're a bad person if you do. Same with CrossFit, and I think it's an excellent way, and I think that CrossFit has done huge things for all strength sports. It's really popularized barbell work, especially for the female community. So I know a lot of women that have come to powerlifting because they started off in CrossFit. So, so a lot of the strength sports, um, they, they owe a lot of praise to CrossFit as a sport for introducing a large amount of people into, into other strength sports. So I think it's amazing. Yeah, awesome. Next question here is, what do you think the best accessory lift is to increase a max deadlift? You know, I've done a number of posts on this on my social media. Now, I do think that accessory exercises are great, but I think that most people are trying to find the magic pill or the, 
the, the optimal uh, accessory exercise to improve the deadlift when their deadlift technique is so poor that they shouldn't be looking elsewhere. They should be spending a little bit more time on mastering the exact movement of a deadlift. Now, just, you know, a deadlift is seen as a heavy exercise, but just because you can lift a lot of weight with a deadlift doesn't mean you always have to. I yeah. spend a lot of time deadlifting, you know, loads around 50% of my max, really mastering my technique. Um, and doing this has improved my deadlift game significantly. So, so I don't want to say that the deadlift accessories have no place when it comes to your deadlift progression. But I do think people are too quick to jump to the accessories when they just need to be spending a little bit more time mastering the actual deadlifts. Yeah, fair. Now I'm going to take three more questions. The first one is going to be, do you have any recommendations for a startup routine post-hip replacement recovery? Yes, and I'm going to refer to someone that I work with very closely. Uh, for those who follow me, you hear me say his name a lot, and that's uh, Andrew Locke. He's the best rehabilitation specialist in the game. And he has a lot of great information on his page, so at Andrew Locke Strength, um, on his Instagram page, especially when it comes to hips, but also spines and shoulders. And before all of his workouts, um, he does hip ex or glute activation exercises, which since I've been implementing them with my own game and my athletes and on online clients, the results have been amazing. A lot less injuries, a lot better movement, and a lot more strength gains. So hip activation, I, sh I should say glute activation exercises, and I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Get over to Andrew Locke's page, um, and he talks about it a hell of a lot. Yeah, cool. Next one is, uh, what are your tips to help improve a person's arch in the bench press? Back to the foam roller. Um, you know, I'll use the foam roller uh, horizontally across my thoracic spine. So if you don't know where that is, imagine um, girls don't have to imagine, but guys, if you were to wear a bra, where your bra strap would be, lay on the foam roller horizontally across the exact position where your bra strap would be um, and just relax on the foam roller and perform uh, extension exercises. You know, you can do that for about three to five minutes just just arching and coming forward and arching and coming forward slowly that's my favorite way apart from that uh performing the bench press technique that i teach uh for those of you who don't know what it is go to my website strainsbenchcoach.com go to the article section and i've got a free bench press tutorial just simply performing the movement will help you train your thoracic spine which is the part of the back that we're trying to arch uh in extension Mm, awesome. Next one and the last question is going to be, do you think knee sleeves are necessary to keep the knees healthy and are there any brand recommendations? Um, I don't want to say that they're necessary because you can maintain healthy knees without knee sleeves, but they definitely help and I love them and I recommend them for anyone who performs squatting pattern movements. Um, mm. My two favorite brands are Mark Bell Slingshot, so, so his brand is called Strong. Um, strong knee sleeves, as well as SBZ. Uh, yeah. They seem to be the top two brands with the best lifters in the world for good reason, and that is because they are excellent quality knee sleeves. So, strong by Mark Bell or SBZ. All right, there you go. Well, that is all the questions we had for today. Um, do you have anything else to say to us about yourself? Or no, I, I, I love this chat. Thank you so much for making the time to have this chat with me, Kimmy. I appreciate it. And a big thank you to everyone who came on. Um, and sent in their questions. Uh, I look forward to doing it all again next Tuesday. Me too. And, and there you have it, guys. So again, another live Q&A with Bass. Today we got to know Bass, and we also got to hear some answers to some technical questions that you guys sent in. We'll be here again next Tuesday at 12 o'clock on a different topic, and we'll see you then. Look forward to it. See you, Kimmy. Right. Thanks.